Hi everyone, I'm Bev Sherritt with, from the Patents Project. I am their specialist for blindness and low vision with issues related to assistive technology and accessible materials for the IEP. I'm today working with the PASS Project to bring you this webinar about student-centered literacy, hands on the why. I'd like to share with you some tools that I've developed and that others have developed to help sift through the complicated questions that arise when we consider devices for our students with blindness and, no, and low vision. We'll talk about forming teams to come up with the right device at the right time, the right method at the right time. So let's get started. I'd like to share with you this slide which is a chart with all of the specialists who work for patents. Some of the names are familiar to you as regional specialists prior to last year, and new specialists were hired to take on different specialties in the ever-changing world of technology. This page is also available on the patents website. So if you have a very specific problem, for example, AAC, or questions about a preschooler, we have someone covering all of those areas. And if it is a combination of issues, for example, a student with blindness and low vision who also has AAC needs or is a preschooler, then we can definitely team up and bring two specialists to you if you have that specific need. Much of what we're doing at Patents right now is driven by what is described on this graphic that was developed by the state in response to the Every Student Succeeds letter, the ESSA letter. And we, uh, as teachers for the blind and low vision and other professionals working with that population, desire equity and access so that we get great outcomes from our students. And this diagram uh, delineates how that can be done through collaboration, instruction, curriculum, and assessment in a universal design learning environment. As a way to make this webinar interactive, I've created a Padlet wall on the web, and you can access it by using the URL, URL on this slide or the QR code, barcode, that's shown on the screen. If you haven't used a QR code reader before, you can download an app on your smartphone. Just search your app store for QR code reader, and there are many free ones out there. Once you have the app loaded, when you aim your phone's camera at the code, it's much like a barcode on a device uh, when you're shopping at the grocery store. It's gonna take you right to this Padlet wall. And the Padlet wall is a place where you can share your story, your ideas with others about the topics we'll be discussing in the webinar. If you are listening along and you have something you think of, uh, definitely go to the Padlet wall, share a story, share an idea, and uh, it will make the experience a little more interactive. Uh, if you're not using QR codes with your students, they're great for students who may need to go to multiple websites, but might have difficulty typing in the URLs for those websites. So if they are doing a project where they need to gather information from all over the web, you might generate QR codes, which can also be done with free software on your computer that you can download. And you can create a sheet of barcodes that the student could just aim their iPad, phone, whatever device they have with a camera at it, and it can take them to the multiple websites. So it's also a great tool to use with your students. As we talk about device selection today and different tools, I want to make it clear that above and all else, we need to consider student preference throughout the whole process and keeping the student in the center. 
uh, in the course of choosing devices for students over the years, I think I've gotten in the way sometimes and not listened well to the student and then uh, have ended up purchasing or borrowing a device that the student didn't take ownership in. And in order to get buy-in from the student, we really need to listen to them and consider their preferences in addition to their abilities. So um, I encourage you, and I'll hopefully bring us back to that throughout the presentation. I received a lot of questions this year that center around when and the timing of introducing a device to a student. And I thought I would take a moment and talk about timing and the decision to start the process. The factors that I think play into this are, first of all, are students that are uh, in the younger half of our caseloads are native users of these devices, that they have had devices in their hands from a very early age. And that's not something we've experienced. Um, so I think it's tough for us to understand what that's like to be a native user and a little intimidating for us since we ourselves we may be good at our phones and our tablets, but we're not native users. But we need to understand that uh, more and more, the older we get and the younger our students get that they are native users. So uh, whether we are ready or not, they are, and they are desiring to use these devices uh, at the same speed of their peers. And I, I have that as a factor. Also, what are the expectations for peers? That may vary from district to district, depending on what the district priorities are. But many districts are introducing devices at a very early age. And so when our students are placed in those situations, I think we feel like we want our students to be keeping up with them. And I think that is an important factor uh, as far as them fitting in and finding a way to use the device that parallels the way their peers do. And more and more that is becoming available for our students. So I think you should consider that as a factor. Again, student preference and ability, those two hand in hand. Finding the key to their internal motivation. Is the device motivating for them or is it not? It's okay to put off introducing a device if that is not something that is motivating for them. Be a good listener with them and with their families and find out what it is that they love and try to connect that with the device. So a preferred activity, music, if they love music and you can incorporate that some way with the introduction of the advice as the, the first thing they do with it, then that's gonna give them a positive experience with it and make them want to use the device more. Definitely, we need to consider their literacy levels determined by that thorough functional vision and literacy evaluation. And for our students with Braille needs, we need to consider their, uh, definitely their motor abilities and how much we've worked with them on paper and those important positioning activities that you would need to do uh, either paralleling while introducing a Braille device or before introducing a Braille device. I don't think it is unheard of or necessarily wrong to introduce an electronic device from the beginning, but I would think it would be wrong to introduce only an electronic device in the absence of paper because I think our students need to have experience with both. And also a big factor is when you feel comfortable with the device. And of course they are changing rapidly. And so this is a, a difficult thing. That's one of the reasons they have added me as a specialist with the Patents Project is to help you over the bumps with these devices. And definitely call me if you wanna learn about a new device. Uh, we can schedule a personal training uh, where I can come to you or we could work together over the internet.
Another major factor to consider when you're looking at Braille displays specifically is that Braille displays work via a screen reader. So those little bumps going up and down only will do so if you have a screen reader running, such as JAWS, VoiceOver, NVDA, or Vox. So if you're considering a Braille display for a student, you really need to consider the platform that the district uses and that your device is using for the Braille display so that they are compatible. I wanted to make sure everyone understood that text comes uh, into the computer and that is transmitted into voice. And then only when it's transmitted into voice by one of these programs does it become Braille on the display. So if you are considering a Braille display, then you're also considering either the purchase or downloading of a free voice program such as NVDA. Here are some other major factors that also have to do with platforms, in particular, the platform that the school might be using to put content on the web, such as Blackboard or Canvas. And you want to check compatibility with your device before a purchase. This is why a trial period is so crucial. You want to know, will a tablet or a laptop play the content? A lot of tablets do not do uh, Java. So if the content is going to be coming through with a lot of Java, then you'll want to make sure you have a device that can play that. And you want to ask the team of teachers in general ed uh, what how they're going to be posting content as PDFs, as documents, so that when you look at apps for your student to interact with that content, can they take a PDF and read it aloud if that's what's needed? Uh, will the student be able to interact with that content? I was working with a student and a teacher this year and we were able to easily download documents from the web but they were docx files and their tablet could not he could not interact with docx files so um, we had to make some adjustments there so always test out formats and platforms with the device before you purchase Then finally, some other factors to consider might be portability. Does the student have any physical limitations so that they need a lighter weight device? Or is the device easily put into a backpack and carried around if that student would like to do that independently? Of course, we'd like to see them do that independently so that they can take that with them, that skill with them as they move beyond high school. Uh, you'll definitely want to consider those tasks and settings that they're going to be using the device in and considering how the device will be set up there. Uh, ergonomics, uh, pretty much what we've been saying with portability, tasks and settings is the keyboard on the Braille display, uh, something that the student is comfortable with. They may want to take a trip to Easter Seals and try the feel of different keyboards on different displays. They have a great setup at Easter Seals in Indianapolis where you can go to their lab and check out different things. Uh, the type of keyboard, whether it be Braille or uh, print keyboard, checking that out in advance. Do you need a Bluetooth keyboard with your tablet? Does it need to have a large display on it? There are a lot of types available. Another factor to really consider is, is there going to be support with this device? You have uh, patents and me as a resource, but you also want to ask who you're purchasing your device from, how much support they can count on, that you can count on from them. And also your previous experience with the device is a factor. Here are six different Braille devices that we have in the Patents Library. And just to give you an idea in the difference in ergonomics, I wanted to show you and compare these. The Braille Sense, the Orbit, the Refresher Braille, 
This is the Braille Note Apex. This is a Braille display from HumanWare called a Brailliant. And over here we have the Braille Note Touch, which is the newest Braille note taker and display from HumanWare. The Refresher Braille and the Orbit are available for checkout with quota funds, funds from APH and you would work with Leslie Durst at the IERC to check those out. But if you'd like to trial them, Patents is also carrying them just to add another layer so that before you uh, check out this type of device, you might wanna trial it to see if it's appropriate for the student. The Orbit and the Refresher Braille have a limited number of cells, 18 and I believe 20, on the orbit. But for a beginning younger child, these are small, nice for small hands. And if you're only using them for one word tasks like spelling lists or just practicing letters, typing them over and over, um, these might be a great place to start. Plus you are able to check them out for free while you're doing that beginning instruction. And while in those early years, they're becoming solid Braille readers. These other displays are for more advanced braille readers who need a bigger display. It's still limited to a line which can be, you know, a couple of words up to four or five words. Um, these two devices are note takers, standalone, and displays. And then the Brilliant is just a braille display that can be connected to a laptop or a tablet. Whoops, back a slide. Um, and then this is a major advancement that HumanWare has made with the Braille Light, Braille Note Touch. And it is a Droid tablet, a Google based tablet that has, that they've built a Braille device around. All of these other devices, they've built the Braille device with its own operating system and made them fit with the the world of computers and tablets but this is new in that they started with the tablet and built the braille around it so it's very intuitive since it has a visual screen for anyone to help the student along with the device so you can triple click on the tablet and it becomes a just a google sighted person's tablet so that if the student is getting hung up or needs help, then any sighted person, a gen ed teacher, anybody on the tech staff would be able to help them. And then simply triple click again and it becomes uh, the Google, the Braille light touch that the student can read the Braille on. This is also incredibly useful socially because the student in a peer editing situation or a small group situation in a general ed classroom would be able to interact with their peers more freely because the peer would be able to type on the screen because when you make it a regular google tablet a keyboard pops up so they could write or share a google doc with their partner who does not have sight then the uh partner, read it in Braille, help edit it, and then pass it back to them, and it becomes a sighted tablet again. So I think this is an important advancement, and I think uh, all of the other companies are working on keeping up with that. I'm going to share a bit here about the Patents Lending Library and just give you a brief tour. I am located at the Patents uh, homepage, patentsproject.com. And if you scroll down in our homepage, Lending Library is prominent in the middle. So I'm going to click on that. And then from here, you can go right to our catalog to search for an item. Um, this is also where you're going to find our loan request form. So if you decide you want to borrow something, it's a very easy form to fill out. You can use the QR code or just click on that link. And then this is the evaluation form that you'll use when you're done using the item. Please complete that. That really helps us to gather data and know 
what to order more of and less of and just gives us great feedback. So I'm going to go to the library catalog and give you guys some helpful hints. If you're, this has everything that is available for all different disabilities, but if you want to look specifically for vision, you can add that to the category. And if you want to know what we have that is the latest and greatest, the things that have just come in new, what I would do is go to keyword and type in the most recent uh, year. And actually the most recent order year right now would be 2016. So type that in. At the end of the summer, you can type in 2017 in the catalog will be updated for all the new things we ordered this summer. So I'm going to click find products. And this will show you the four newest things that we have, the Dolphin, Supernova, Magnifier, and Speech, uh, speech uh, Screen Reader. And then the Prodigy Connect Magnifier, we have the Visio book that's new this year that you can also check out from the iCam, and that Braille Note Touch that is the new Braille display. Now I'm back at the search page and I'm going to look for all the magnifiers that are in the library. So I've narrowed it down by vision uh, and I'm gonna type in magnifier and find products, clicking on that. And now I see there are two pages. This is the first page and there are low tech devices. We have bar magnifiers in our library and we also have handheld magnifiers and video magnifiers. On um, the second page, I think there are five or six more. So there, that would be the way to search for all magnifiers if you're looking for a particular device or if you wanted to compare a couple, order them, borrow them for a uh, a six week trial period. Here's a screen with some magnifiers available from the Patents Project Library. And on the top row are some handheld magnifiers. This is a Pebble device. I think that's a four inch screen. No, wait, this is the Pebble. This is the Nemo. This is a Ruby, and then this is the new Ruby 7-inch larger screen with a pivot cam. It's the newest Ruby in that family. Then on the bottom row, we have the larger distance magnifiers, although they can also do near, but they are less portable. And I think we have, I know this is the Prodigy Connect, this is the Prodigy Duo. I think this is the Onyx maybe, and then we also have a Vizio book down here. But um, they all have a screen for viewing to enlarge with different levels of magnification. They all have the great features of being able to vary the displays depending on the student's eye condition. Of all of these are getting more and more portable. Uh, the distance magnifiers, these two would probably need to be moved from class to class on a cart rather than picking them up. But these two fold into a compact carryable version. This one weighs a, quite a bit more, the Visio book, than the new Prodigy Connect. This one, when it folds down, would weigh about as much as an iPad. And it also available you can get it just to do the near magnifying as a stand or you can get a clip on camera so that you can do distance magnification and see it on the screen so again these are getting more and more portable more and more user friendly as you're looking at magnifiers for your students and their different features if your budget is limited or if you see your student being exceptionally savvy with a tablet, you might consider thinking outside the magnifier box and using their tablet as their magnifier or perhaps dedicating a tablet as a magnifier and another tablet as the one they use for their worksheet work or book reader. 
This slide has a link to a video on how to use iPads as magnifiers using an app called the Better Vision app. And I learned this from an expert who from the East Coast, Therese Wilcom. She is known as the MacGyver for devices for folks with disabilities. And she has many, many ideas and great ideas for apps on how to use everyday items and readily available devices such as the iPad for folks with disabilities. So you might want to check out that link and uh, using this in this picture, she's used an iPad Pro as the distance magnifier and a regular size iPad as a near magnifier. And she's built a stand out of items you can get at uh, the at Lowe's or the hardware store to create your own stand. And when you're considering costs, iPads and iPads Pro, iPad Pros are expensive but so are the dedicated devices. So you may want to weigh these out when you are considering magnification. Therese is a presenter at our state patents conference in the fall in November. And if you've never been to the conference, she is one great reason to attend just to see all of her different low cost ideas in using readily available materials and technology to assist your students. The registration for our fall conference is currently online on our website. So if you're planning ahead for fall professional development, go to your director and ask if you can come to our patent state conference. Now that we've talked about all the different factors that we need to consider, we need a way to sort through these factors to narrow things down and to make sense of all the different things we need to consider. I'm going to share with you the SET framework, which is a set of documents developed by Joy Zabala. And I've referenced her below. You can go to her website, joyzabala.com, and download uh, several different documents that help with organizing your information. I also have developed my own AT form that I used in my district, and I, that document is being shared with the presentation documents. I took my district AT evaluation and basically changed the questions and some of the input to make it specific for blind low vision and those devices. So that's going to be available. But I really like this set framework. The SETT stands for Student Environment Tasks and Tools. And it brings us back to that student-centered approach where we first take a look at the student. What, in the case with blind low vision, what is their functional vision and their functional literacy? What are they bringing in the way of background knowledge? Are they a native user? Have they been using devices already? So definitely spending time looking at the student, their desires, their preferences, their abilities then taking a look at the environment that they're going to be in and working with those teachers that they will have to know what they're going to need. Then asking those teachers, what kind of tasks are you going to be doing daily, weekly? What will your students need to be able to do using a tablet uh, so that you might determine what tasks you, the student with the braille display or magnifier will need to do too. And only then after you've gone through evaluating the student's needs, the environments and the tasks, do you start to talk about tools because you have given the foundation or the framework of these first three important things before you consider a tool rather than going straight to many different tools and trying to sort through them that way. I have, this is one of her documents that I've partially filled in. She uses chart, charts, which I really like because you can get a lot of information on one page by uh, using columns and rows. 
So I have taken different descriptors that you might have as factors for a braille display and such as what kind of word processing do, does it do? Does it use Word documents? Does it have just its own operating system? Can it do internet access? Here's the platforms we talked about. So then for each tool that you are going to look at, and it might be an electronic tool, it might also be a more low-tech tool. So for example, if you had a column for math, and the student really only uses uh, unlined paper and a Sharpie for math, then that would be the tool that's appropriate for them and you could include it on this. So other things, display of another device, the number of braille cells, will it do book reading and what do I need on the device to do book reading? How is textbook access accomplished with this tool? And so you would list all of the tools and then fill in the chart to see how well this tool met the needs that you've determined based on the student, the environments, the tasks, and then listing out the tools. Then here's another one that I filled out all the way uh, for a particular student helping another teacher this year using it for low vision. And we were looking, they were trying to decide between a number of varied devices for three different high school students. And so we tried to summarize their needs since they all went to the same small high school and would be taking similar classes in the chart. So for a Chromebook, if that was something they would consider, can the textbook be enlarged? Well, it can, but the screen's pretty small in a Chromebook, so that was unacceptable. Um, and an iPad, yes, the, the screen is smaller, um, but if they went with an iPad Pro, um, even better. But they could do the single swipe and enlargement was easier. Um, and this one, they would need software, so there was money involved for enlargement on these two devices. You can automatically enlarge with the swipe. So you can include cost factors in your chart as well. Once everything is filled in, then you can sort of read across for each device. I have a lot of yeses for the iPad Pro, a lot of noes for the Chromebooks, and um, a varying amount with other things. So this is something you could take to your director and just be very specific and summarize needs using a chart such as this. In addition to those documents as resources, I'd also like to recommend other resources to help you on the journey with your students and finding the right tool for the right student environment and task. I would encourage you to attend trainings, conferences, and tech expos. Our patents conference is in November and it's not too early to sign up to come next fall. That conference has presenters from the field using devices in real life situations. And it does have vision specific presenters, some really uh, great national speakers in that field. Our tech expo is always in the spring. And we, uh, for the tech expo, rather than teacher and administrator presenters, the vendors present and we have all then a lot of vendors represented in the hall so if you want to get your hands on devices and see them in action come to the tech expo and it is available at no cost to you take advantage of our patents lending library and we're adding new devices all the time and we're listening to you if there is a device you'd like to check out and you don't see it in our library definitely contact me and we'll see what we can do because uh, we're adding new devices every year. Of course, most of you know about the IERC and the ICAM checkout. And when you are uh, checking out the higher dollar items at this point, such as the Visio book magnifier or the Braille displays, you will need to provide extra documentation. But uh, the organization definitely wants to make sure we've done our due diligence in this sound documentation and doing the work of determining 
uh, that student's functional vision and functional literacy before we make the move towards a device and keeping that student-centered approach. If you have a device that you need and you're not finding it or it is out of your district's reach at this point, check the listserv, post your need um, on the listserv. There might be a device that was used by a student that's no longer being used and just sitting on a shelf somewhere. So post your needs, see if there's a district that might be willing to sell you a device, a slightly used device. If you have those devices sitting on a shelf and would like to see them used, post that as well so that others might be able to access those by uh, purchasing them from your district or your co-op. Seek out a tech savvy team member. I have seen this coming into play more and more with AT eval teams where they have someone from tech staff who works specifically with special ed. And if there isn't such a person in your district, go ahead and try to recruit a geek, maybe from your local STEM club or your robotics club, maybe even a high school student or someone from a local college that has strong skills with devices. And a lot of these kids who are in the STEM and robotics club need volunteer hours for things such as National Honor Society. And they are looking for projects. They're looking for ways to um, put uh, wonderful things on their resume and what would be more wonderful than them helping a student and a teacher team sort through the different factors and, and maybe helping you figure out a device once you get it. So tap into the resources that are sitting there in your local school district and in your local town. Make sure you do ask your sales reps for the support that they can give you. Uh, I worked with many of them this year and they are very willing to come out and give you a demo or to troubleshoot with you if you are uh, having a difficulty getting a device to do what you want. I'm also mentioning our Patents Grant Program and that is currently, uh, the application is on our website and you can get to it from this link. It is a program where you can get technology for your whole district and it is uh, supporting universal design for learning and it will um, bring a lot of good things to your district. If you want to know more about that, please visit our website. Finally, I'd just like to say that uh, as soon as you figure out the next device, a new device will come along. And as frustrating as that is, it's also very exciting for our students. And uh, this is a uh, depiction of something they've been working on at the University of Michigan, and I've seen other prototypes for a full page braille display on a tablet where the uh, braille display is made by puffs of air rather than by mechanical pins, uh, enabling the display to be a lot larger and a lot cheaper. Also, this would be user-friendly in the way that the braille light touches because it looks more like a mainstream device than a device that was especially designed for our students. So I am hopeful that things are getting more and more compact, more and more user friendly. I really do see things getting better for our students and the future is bright. Please contact me uh, when you need help with technology. Um, that's what I get paid to do. And uh, thank you for attending this webinar.